Last time on Shorlonen, the fishing vessels Amity and Ocean Venture battled with a Force 9 gale. Now Amity skipper Jimmy Bucken must decide how much longer he dares keep his crew at sea. We're the only boat left down here. All the other boats are gone home. They've got sins. On Ocean Venture, as John Bucken tries to free his net from the seabed, a vital chain breaks. A hundred and seventy miles from home, the ocean venture is caught in a storm. Having caught little fish so far, skipper John Buchan has decided to continue fishing, despite the weather. We've nine of a crew to pay. We don't catch any fish, they don't get no money, they don't get paid. Once again, the catch is poor. For John, the big problem is the wear on the nets. Where we're working in the snow at the moment is very, very bad in the gear. A set of chains, which cost about 15, 1,600 pounds. They get, they get worn away at the trips out here. Just, the bottom is very abrasive, it's like sandpaper. Oh, there's a lot of stress in this job. The work done, for now at least. The crew go below to get some sleep. Through warnings of gales in Viking, Norfolk, Sarah, Forties, Cromarty, Forth, Shannon, Rockall, Dallin, Hebrides, Bailey, Fair Isle, Ferris, Twenty minutes later, the boat shudders to a halt. Her nets have snagged on the seabed a hundred meters below. Dragging along the ocean floor, they've caught on a massive rock. With the boat unable to move, one big wave could send her to the bottom. First mate Barry Lauder must lead the crew onto the deck to try and free the net. And um, it's bad not being fast as it is, but Force 9 gale out there just now, so it's pretty dangerous. From the wheelhouse, there's little John can do to help his crew. Take it up, he could break it, break a chain. They could take a roll, big lump of water, wash him off their feet. So you have to be very vigilant all the time, keep, keep your eyes on him. We can try and get this net aboard as quick as we can. Without warning, the obstruction gives way. As the crew haul the net aboard, the dangerous situation gets suddenly worse. A chain has broken under the strain. The rocky seabed has worn through the hardened steel. But the chain snapped. We'll lose the other side. The other side snapped. We're going to lose the whole net. The whole net is now held on only one inch thick warp. If it breaks, they'll lose over 30,000 pounds worth of equipment. On the Amity, Jimmy Buchan has steamed through the night to find better fishing grounds. The journey through the storm has taken its toll. The boat's falling apart, look at it. She took a big lump of water last night on the port side and she just whipped that light clean off her. Jimmy's first mate, Kevin right. O'Donnell, is up before dawn after a sleepless night. A very rough passage last night coming up from Blythe. So the boys didn't get a good sleep last night coming up. Bring it up, boy. Holding up, waiting you. What did you do? You nearly took the hand off me. Wait. Jimmy's decided to try his luck at a place called the Ooze Hole. According to his weather forecast, he only has 24 hours before the area is hit by a massive storm. This is my last throw of the dice. You don't want to get caught out here. 50, 60 mile an hour winds to come through this area. 
this thing tomorrow. On the ocean venture, John's nets are hanging on a single gear. The other side goes, you will lose your gear, you'll drop your net. But you're always concerned if, if that happens, that the chains might go off and hit some of the crew. That's the main worry. We're going to always get plenty more gear, but we don't want to injure the crew. Even when they've got it on board, John fears the loose net could drag the crew into the sea. We're looking wet. Come over the net. I've said them. The white halls are doing you looking wet. The broken end of the chain is still dragging in the water behind. Two deckhands are unable to pull it back on board. In the end, it's Barry who thinks up a way of heaving it in. And Tucker repairs damage to the net. Come on, Tucker. We're sweet, but Tucker just spliced this new bag on the bag. Stick it forever. <laughs> The skipper took a chance fishing in the storm. This time, he's got away with it. How do I do? On the Amity, Jimmy's preparing to cast his net in a deep underwater ravine. We're, we're in this area here. We're here, and there's a long hole, trink. And, and this one today we are in is called the Ooze Hole. The Ooze Hole is 18 miles long and over 200 meters deep. There's a good chance of finding prawns, but the jagged contours make the Ooze Hole a hard place to fish. Jimmy's used a computer to create a detailed map of the hole. This piece at the top would be the boat. This is us. And this red line denotes where we are relative to, to the top of the water. I know that my gear is, is in this area here somewhere. Because the gear is behind me. It's casting a shadow on the seabed, which gives me a direction of where I'm pointing on the seabed. And then I've got to, to work out where my gear would be approximately behind me. Jimmy will tow the net along the edge of the ravine for five hours. If he gets it right, there should be a big catch of prawns to show for it. If he gets it wrong, he could lose his nets. The ocean venture has been at sea for a week. Fishing's been disappointing, and John's worried about the morale of his crew. After a long night of interruptions, are now ready to haul in the nets. It's absolutely diabolical, eh? Pathetic. Two over five and a half holes for that. Something wrong. There's no fish. Even enough to feed a family there. Very poor haul. Things just aren't going our way just now. Uh, it's hard to be optimistic when there's just the size of hauls coming on board. Something's going to have to happen quick style. Deckhand Jonathan Cordoner has been at sea since he was a boy. There's a lot of half price coal here. Jonathan's not impressed with this haul. He's starting to wonder about the skipper's plans. John's next brainwave, nobody knows. <laughs> Always expect the unexpected with John. Upstairs in the wheelhouse, John is feeling the pressure. He needs to get results fast. And when it comes to finding fish, the skipper is on his own. 
everything is three of minded. We have to go and what they do. Fish come and go and you just never know. You think you know, but you'll never ever know. Uh, a wee bit smarter than us, I think. In his battle of wits with the fish, John has a secret weapon. Diaries of fishing trips stretching back 27 years. Usually this time of year we're finding fish everywhere. Usually the first time of the year there's usually fish everywhere because the grounds have been well rested. Where have they gone? This time last year, this is the 7th. 7th of January. Last year, with 174 boxes for the day for four holes. 45 boxes, a 32 boxes, a 15 boxes, and an 82 boxes. Mostly good. But it's good fishing. Catching some valuable cod could still make this trip a success. According to John's notes, they may have moved to deeper water. Uh, shifted into deeper water or not, I think we'll have to have a look in deeper water and see if they're there. We'll just have to shift the grounds again, play somewhere else. This is Peter here, the north, northeasterly point in Scotland. We steam down to the, the battlefield, just south of the battlefield in this area, 150 miles. So I think we'll, we'll head east, I think, about 50 miles west of the coast of Norway, to see if we can find some down below, Jonathan's coming round to the skipper's new plan. Why well, get some cord? Big juicy cord. On the Amity, Jimmy and his crew are hauling the net for the first time in the ooze hole. The plans. Jimmy is about to find out if the long journey north was worth it. Now let's give us smiling. Jimmy. He's ended up making the right decision for a change. It's not too often he gets it right, but he got it right this time. See, you'd no faith in me last night. Oh, hey, come on! That's keeping the best ones up his sleeve. That's what it's all about. Look at that. Look at that. That is an absolute beauty. The problem we have now is we know there's a storm coming for 120 miles from home, and we know there's fish on the grounds. <laughs> so what do we do next? The ocean ventures steaming to Norway. The weather's improved, but the morale of the crew is low. Jonathan's first job of the day is to count the boxes of fish they've caught so far. 150 aboard, 850 to catch yet. Better pull our socks up. Don't pull our socks up, we'll be selling our socks. Never mind, at least it's breakfast time. The captain and crew may share a breakfast table, but their feelings about the job are very different. Only time will tell. As a deckhand, Jonathan still hasn't earned any money after a week at sea. Fish has been very poor, really. Yeah. So we're just trying to mend some holes in the bag, just in case that we're losing any fish. It's not good going home if you haven't made any money, but it's always good to get home, no matter what. I've had my wife and I've had daughter at home. I, I miss them. I miss them like a lot when I'm out here. I often wondered if I could maybe work on shore, but left school without any qualifications and so I suppose I'll just have to be a fisherman.
Michael Cowie, the cook, has sailed on the ocean venture for 18 years. I would love to get out of that job if I could, but it's... I mean, it's got a strange pull. I, I thought you hate absolutely hate this job at times. You still come back and get through it all again. Once you've been your trip off, you forget about it and you're ready to do it again. So I never really thought I'd be at the job this long. You know? But for John, fishing is more than just a job. It's a way of life, and it down through generations. My father was a fisherman, my uncle was a fisherman, I have a heap of cousins fishermen, and my grandfather was fisherman, my great-grandfather was fisherman. So it's salt water in the veins and not blood. And I mean, you kind of get much more experience than John, really. He's been at it all his life, Ken, so he's... He's been brought up in it, I, I haven't. I mean, this is fishermen, as many go to sea, and he's a fisherman, I'm just a, I'm just a man who goes to sea. Yeah. When they get to Norway, the crew will find out if John's finally found the right spot. At the ooze hole, Amity's enjoying a run of good luck. However many prawns Jimmy catches, he still has to sell them. How much he makes in the market all depends on prices in Europe. The, the, the bit that disappoints me is all this, every, all goes to the European market. And no one eats them in the UK. Well, very little. But when people go on holiday to, to Spain and Italy and whatever, and, and they go to a nice restaurant and they, and they eat, they order langoustine. What, is, what they don't know is that probably they were caught in the Scottish waters by Scottish fishermen. They're a luxury food. They are expensive. It's, I mean, it, it's not unlike into a, a lobster, the, the texture and the quality, if it's cooked properly. I eat quite a lot of them. I think we're fed up tailing prawns, and look what's in front of us. Prawns again. Go to bed, think about prawns. Wake up, go to work. Prawns, prawns, prawns. It's good though, isn't it? <laughs> in spite of his fear of the weather, the good catchers have tempted Jimmy to stay at sea a bit longer. As the storm closes in, Kevin's starting to question Jimmy's decision. Just a few nice ones just to get a start. So we'll go and have another two and see how we get on. Things changes when he sees money in the hopper. It's the one thing it, it, the skipper's got to have. He's got to have the drive because he's the guy that's responsible for catching the fish to make enough money to pay the crews. For Jimmy to pay the crew, he will have to keep them working through the storm. It's very poor day now, like. It's fairly poor now, like. It must be four, seven there now. It's kind of choppy. I think it's getting worse out here. We're the only boat left down here. All the other boats are gone home. They've got sins. We're not right in the head. Or else he's not right in the head. The Ocean Ventures arrived in deep water off the coast of Norway. After almost a week of poor fishing, John's desperate for a good haul to make the trip worthwhile. The crew's spirits are low, and he's hoping he's tracked down some premium cod. Yeah, there's a few nice cod in there. I don't know if you had, but we're searching. We're getting close. Some big cod there. Big ones. Good fish, cod and monkfish. Really good fish. The boys will be rubbing their hands just now. We can only hit the spot. A haul like this can be worth hundreds of pounds to each member of the crew. 
John's finally found the right place to fish. We're improving, so we'll go and see if we can get some more before it's dark. This is what we're wanting. Nice cod, big haddock. Monkfish are even more expensive than cod. Very ugly, but nice to eat. We're all happy. We could all stand and gut these things all day long. It wouldn't bother us. Very nice cod. Beautiful fish. You see, I'm just smiling now. Uh, makes a change. <laughs> Down signs. Rolling our eyes. We just have to find more now. And that'll make us even happier. That's a biggie, eh? Yeah? That baby, eh? Yeah? Beautiful. Even men have been to sea for maybe 40 years. They got a hull of cod, they're absolutely delighted. Never get fed up seeing cod. That night, John tries another haul in the same place. Oh yeah, they're there. <laughs> Brilliant. And there's more. Yeah, we're well, on that good, boys. <laughs> oh, yeah, beauty. You beauty. You will find them sometime. Eh? And you will know they are. Eh? Here you go, look, that's the proof. Oh, about 70, 80 boxes. Any boxes, mostly good. Brilliant all. Who wants cod and chips? Oh, it feels brilliant. We're out here to make money. And that's, when you see fish like this, you know you're making it. So it keeps the excitement going when you do see, finally see a good haul. With these two hauls, they've caught as much as the rest of the trip put together. John's ready to call it a day. Go home. Eh, we've had enough. We're going home. I think everybody's smiling now. We're going home. We're going home, Johnny Boy. That's good going business, home. is it? Ninety miles from Peterhead on the Amity, Jimmy's hoping he'll get his fish to the market in time. I've decided to haul early because. Uh, and we've got 90 miles to run in. <whistles> 90 miles and five knots. It's going to be a long journey in. Probably got to be about four straight all the way. So I should probably only be making about five or six knots. The Ocean Ventures trip may have been saved by the last two hauls of cod, but how much the crew get paid now depends on the market. Most of the fleet have come in to avoid the storm, and there's a lot of fish for sale. It could drive the prices down. As John unloads his fish for the next morning's market, Amity is racing for the shore. We've maybe left it a wee bit late, but I'm pushing it, pushing the boat Amity full speed tonight to try and catch the market for tomorrow. If he misses the market, his fish will be another day older and prices will drop. Of 78 boxes of whitings, projecting 50 pounds per box, which is going to project a figure of 3,900. I've got my prawns at the bottom, the tails are at £125, and the big ones at £150 per box. 
So my total gross on this spreadsheet is around just under £18,000. The costs of running the boat have to be paid first, but if Jimmy's right about the prices, this trip could make well over a thousand pounds for each man on board. But only if he gets to the market in time. With the Amity still out at sea, John's waiting for the Ocean Ventures catch to be auctioned. The market is already almost full, but with bad weather forecasts keeping many fishermen in the harbor for the coming week, John hopes buyers will be stocking up. Well, soon though, the market's not far away, so well, soon though, all fit. Uh, if it was worth going through the board with her, eh? As Jimmy arrives, the auction has already started. He still has to unload his catch. We're going flat out. Just grab me the wind for it. We've got five minutes, so we've got a quite, quite a lot of work to do. crew work faster when I cut it fine. If they know they've plenty of time, they'll dilly-dally. The price of fish in the market depends on how fresh it is. Every day counts. Fish is going to be another day older if we don't get this market. Uh, yeah. I can hear them shouting. They're going. They're getting closer. Do you hear them shouting? At the other end of the market, John's cord is about to be auctioned. Well, for these sizes, I would look for the... About 90 pounds, I would think. But I guess. But I'm, I'm just selling them. I'm not buying them. <laughs> the bidding starts at 80 pounds. Maybe as much as you want. 80 pounds. 2, 4, 6, 8, 90. 2, 4, 96, 8, 100. 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 110. One more, no. <laughs> That's such a big, big price. I didn't expect that much. 110 pounds per box. With almost 200 boxes on sale, John's cod alone have grossed 18,000 pounds. Jimmy has managed to get to the market, and the prices are still good, especially for the prawns. Got a really big return there. So I was predicting I was going to make about 18,000 and we've made just under 20. And Jimmy's wife Irene arrives to give him a lift home. Hi, dear. Hello, how are you doing? Hi, Good taste of lipstick. Bye bye, Amity. <laughs> Next time on Trollerman. In the hunt for Haddock, trawlers risk collision on treacherous seas. With a storm brewing, will Skipper Sandy Watt go for glory or race for home? <laughs>